This episode of Agalia Chats is brought to you by Wovic, the world's only open source browser for XR devices, such as Huawei VR Glass, MetaQuest 2, 3, and Pro, and the Pico 4. Wovic recently launched a Discord community at wovic.com slash discord and a merch store for all your Wovic outfitting needs at wovic.com slash store. You can find out more about the browser at wovic.com. Okay, hi, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Egalia. And uh, on this episode of Egalia Chats, we're going to talk about uh, web components. They're kind of seem to be having a moment where they've captured the attention of a lot of bloggers and, and things, right? Yeah. Uh, including this guy, Eric Meyer. Uh, MeyerWeb is his... Is his uh, domain i don't know if you read his stuff no i try not to yeah uh you recently posted a thing blinded by the light dom and yeah. uh yeah i don't know do you want to um what the post is about is me going into a deep dive as to hey here's a fully light dom web component that i created and also doing this was the moment where i realized that custom elements and fully light dom web components are cool actually. Uh, whereas for a long time, web components, just like I didn't get it. And there have been a number of posts along those lines. Uh, Jim Nielsen had a using web components on my icon galleries websites, which is one of the things that sort of bumped me to the point where I could have this breakthrough. He has a bunch of galleries of icons that he has collected. So he has all of the icons from the one password app for several versions. It's online that anyone could look at. And he wrote this post about how he redid his icon galleries to use web components. And when I read it, I was like, I don't quite get what he's saying, but I, I can tell that there's something here that I should be interested in, um, which is no, nothing, uh, against Jim, he had a perfectly fine post. It's just like, I didn't get it yet. And there's stuff that you've written, Brian, that again, nothing against you, but you've written about web components in the past. And I read about them. I was like, yeah, that seems cool. But like, I don't, I don't get it. This, I mean, this is kind of a statement on uh, writing and evangelism and adoption of features in general. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think. You know, there's always that, like, should I write about X? Because X is really interesting to me. But I don't know, maybe like 100 other people have already written about that. Mm. You know, like, the answer is yes, because um, like, if yeah. you're just discovering it, you're just getting into it. The the previous attempts really haven't reached you. So maybe you, you take your thing and you, you reach a whole bunch more people. Yeah, I mean, always write about it. Because it might only be one other person that you achieve that breakthrough for but that's one more person. And maybe they then in the course of talking about what they learned, they reach a whole bunch more people. Or maybe you, you know, when you blog about it and somebody notices it and it sort of goes viral, like that leads to the break-in for a lot of people. And it's just, we don't all understand things in the same way. <laughs> we yeah. don't process things in the same way. And so sometimes what maybe you're waiting for is for someone to explain it in a way that you get. Whereas maybe the other people explained it in a way that other people got, but you didn't. But yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be like my post, which was over 3,500 words. Like <laughs> I went super long. A lot of the kids these days would, would be like, yeah, TLDR. But, you know, from feedback I've gotten on social media and in comments on the post itself, because I actually do allow comments, people have said, wow, I finally get it. Yeah. Right. And I had that moment just a little bit before they did. And I think Jim Nielsen maybe had that moment a little bit before I did. You know, people like you and Jeremy Keith had that moment a long time ago. But for whatever reason, for me personally, it didn't sink in. And part of me thinks that in my case, I I probably had too much baggage, I'll be honest, from having written HTML since late 1993. Like mm -hmm. In a month, it will have been 30, literally 30 years since I wrote my first HTML document. Well, actually less than a month now that I look at the calendar. And so I, I just had all these sort of built-in assumptions that I wasn't re-examining. And 
the confluence of a, of a few factors helped me break through that. There are probably other people who don't have that same baggage or who have, you know, sort of different built-in assumptions. And maybe your post that you put up, you person listening to this, if you discover a thing or suddenly understand a thing, write about it because somebody else might see that and you help them have the breakthrough that maybe they have been looking at a thing for years going, yeah, it seems interesting, but I don't, I don't understand why it's useful. Most of us had that moment at some point reading an article about CSS custom properties. Yeah, that's, I think that's a great example. And uh, going back to that whole thing I was saying about like the, you know, the, the adoption curve and everything. Um, when we begin to adopt things, we typically get pretty basic, simple things, right? It takes us a while. It takes people to like push the envelope and then write things mm -hmm. that are like interesting new ways of, of looking at or thinking about things. So mm -hmm. Uh, it, we will be several years into a thing in general before we really even, you know, anybody is doing the super, super interesting stuff because it, it takes a while to get your head around it and all, all that. So, yeah. Yeah. So like your, your example with custom properties, like people are doing just phenomenally amazing things with custom properties now that I wouldn't have imagined. But they didn't do it 10 minutes after we released custom <laughs> properties, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, Romo Komarov, who we just had on the show recently, is doing just mind-bending things with custom properties that I would never have imagined. But that, like you say, Romo probably wasn't doing that 10 minutes after they came into contact with custom properties. They yeah. you know, learned how to use custom properties sort of at a basic level, and then they started to sort of push the envelope. They saw other people pushing the envelope. Sometimes that kind of code tennis, for those who remember Photoshop tennis or layer tennis. Um, so layer tennis was a thing where two designers would be signed up for a, a match, quote unquote. The first of the two would be given a Photoshop file and they'd have 15 minutes to do whatever they wanted to it. And then they would send the result to the other person in the match who would then have 15 minutes to do whatever they wanted to it, send it back and they would go back and forth like five rounds or 10 rounds or something like that. Um, so sometimes code tennis happens. That's been happening between me and Miriam Suzanne around web components, right? So I put up this post and I had some code pen examples to go with it. And Miriam forked one of those <laughs> examples and did some new stuff to it. I was like, whoa, this is cool. So I forked her fork and did some stuff to it and shared it with her. And, you know, she said, oh, wow, some of this is cool. And so like restructured it. And like we were learning as we went. Yeah. And anyone who sort of watched that back and forth might also learn stuff. There were people who were watching sort of this exchange, people who follow both of us on social media and so could see our replies to each other, who said things like, you can do custom events, which was a thing <laughs> neither Miriam or I knew <laughs> when we started. But they came up and it turns out, yes, you can do custom javascript events you could just make up your own events and nobody will stop you for a long time that yeah that one predates custom elements even like i didn't really know that yeah and miriam apparently didn't know that or and also didn't know about dispatch element but i was using in my example i was creating a custom custom event and then dispatching it to cause a thing to happen and so miriam riffed off of that and there were people saying oh wow this is cool and Actually, another person chimed in, I think today or yesterday, saying, I had forgotten about this capability, you know, of custom events, but like this whole sort of back and forth using custom events reminded me of it in work I was doing today that made a really complicated thing I was doing way easier. Yeah, I love it when that happens. Yeah, so even sometimes it's not so much your post will teach someone something new it will remind someone of something that they did know, but had never really used or for some reason had fallen into disuse or might cause them to see a thing that they already know about in just enough of a new way that they realize, oh, I could use that for this thing that I'm working on. And it would make things so much cleaner and easier. Stuff like that is, is really cool. So this is, this is why some of us still blog and it's not all Stack Overflow and MDN. Yeah. Um, which, you know, don't get me wrong, a good deal of the stuff that I 
learned as I was doing this web component work, I looked up on either Stack Overflow or MDN, but you know, putting them together and showing like showing my work literally was like, hey, this is how this works. You know, for some people, been really, uh, really, really helpful. So yeah, that's one of the things you you have to keep in mind. That's always a possibility um, because you and I, I think have both discovered a lot of times you will just put so much thought and effort into saying a thing and it's crickets just for whatever reason, nobody yeah. really responds or shows interest or whatever. And then the thing that you never expected would change somebody's life does. That is so accurate. I just can't even, I mean, just like the thing that you just like, you know, I mean, you don't even have to get into like just the things that change somebody's life. I mean, you can just look look at like social media too. Like sometimes you write some very deep, thoughtful thing and you share it on social media and it's just like seems to get nothing. And then, right. you know, you make one offhanded comment with like five seconds thought into it and suddenly it explodes and it's this huge thing, right? Like it's yeah. completely unpredictable. And it's it's the same thing with, with blogging. So yeah. But yeah, I mean, web components are just, I feel like, at least in the circles that we run in, there's there's sort of a, a an awareness of oh, okay, wait, this this is a thing that we can use to augment the web. So Jeremy Keith just wrote about this, where he was sort of casting about for what, like, what do we call this? What is this? And I actually like he didn't exactly propose the term web augmentation, but I kind of like it um, because I th I think in some of the best patterns of using custom elements and light DOM web components, you're augmenting what HTML already provides. The post that I wrote about what I call super sliders, which is range inputs that have extra things associated with them through the scripts of, and, and the markup of the, of the web component of the custom element. I didn't re-implement range sliders and I didn't re-implement, you know, buttons. I just, used uh, input range and and button elements stuff like that and just use javascript to sprinkle a little extra on top basically um and not to make them look different in fact i don't think i even try to style the range input it's just as you change this input the component has patterns that let you say okay when this changes like when this input value is changed the effects are applied in this other place in a sort of a very modular way. And Miriam made it even more modular. That was part of the code tennis that we were doing where she was taking what I had put together and making it much more flexible, more generic. Generic's not the right word, but you know what I mean? So that rather than being very focused on, okay, so this is about changing font sizes. You know, she made it so that you know, you can change this range slider and you can say what it's supposed to change. Yeah. And then the JavaScript just looks at the markup and says, oh, okay, this is what we're doing, which is really useful. And now I want to like completely rework the tool that I created <laughs> that I was writing about in my post to use her pattern. I'm not going to do it, but I want to. Yeah. Um, that's, that's really fun. And actually like it was um, one of the ideas with, you know, like the extensible web manifesto was that we were supposed to go out and invent these because exactly that kind of thing happens in the wild, right? You can say, Hey, I have this really great idea and I've thought about it so deeply and here it is. Anybody can use it. And like very, very quickly, somebody will come in and say, Oh yeah, but what if we just, <laughs> and we'll improve it. Right. And then the idea was like, things can compete in the wild and very, very rapidly improve. And then we will have like some component that is like this, that winds up used everywhere, you know? And then we can say, boy, maybe, maybe we should just have that element. That would be really great. <laughs> you know, just have a standard version of that element or something. So I, I really love that that happens. And the th one of the things that I think has always hung it up from happening more is that, um, there is sort of like no, there's no great way other than here is like a single uh, author or a 
single component library made of web components that I like and trust for you to discover them and have any sort of faith or sense of them, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, that's a thing that I also tried to set up. I, I think I mentioned this in our Brad Frost talk too, where we, I think we talked about web components kind of a bit in that one where I, I thought we should focus on that somehow. Like we should set up a, uh, sort of underwriters labs for web components where you could submit them and get, you know, other people to review them from like cross disciplinary, like this is accessibility, this is performance, this is styleability and so on, you know, mm -hmm. and then you can help the kind of cream rise to the top that way. Um, right. But yeah, I love that that happens. I wanted to mention that uh, Jeremy Keith wrote a really good post in 2016 mm -hmm. um, that was called Extensible Web Components, where he talks about some of the same things that you talk about. And I think we should like highlight them here because I think I, I see like repeatedly people discover sort of like similar ish things. And maybe we can just sort of like talk about them a little bit and mouth blog them <laughs> so like it is very very tempting for you to mint a new element that is just the element itself so like the example you could use in yours is like mm. fancy slider right right like, you, you could just make a thing called fancy slider you know like it, it just has the attributes on it or whatever but that's it it's just you put the element in and good but uh, if anything goes wrong with that page or there's no JavaScript or whatever, while the page is loading, it's just empty. There's nothing there, right? Like it's just right. like putting an empty span in your page. Yep. That kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the alternative to this is that you decorate some otherwise good HTML and CSS anyway. So like in your example, you put an input inside it and you say like, this is what it's based on mm. and you provide the raw materials and we'll just decorate it. And that is actually the design of web components is supposed to be toward that. Mm. You know, there is this tension in web components where when you define a web component, you say like extends HTML element. Do you know what I mean? In the class. Yep. I know. I know what you're talking about. Cause I actually did do that just recently. Yeah, so you have to say extends HTML element, and um, there was an idea in there that you could extend other elements so that you would inherit. But the problem, the reason that there's a tension there is that inheritance is limited and flawed, right? When you say something is a that, it means it is, and the trouble is it isn't. Mm -hmm. You have other parts of your fancy slider that aren't just the range, right? They're, they're more, they contain more than just the range or else in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, like why would you be building it? Right? Yeah. And so there's this kind of tension and there's this, um, this is an old kind of observation and it's called the Liskov substitution principle, uh, that guides this. And there's also like the famous, like gang of four, design patterns book that stresses composition over inheritance. And so like you're adopting a pattern that is saying like, we're going to use composition here. You, you're going to give me these raw materials and I'm going to build something more than just their parts. Right. And that's usually a better option anyway. Like I think it's great that people discover that and you know, wind up there on their own and say, boy, that is a really good idea. <laughs> you know, I think what you're what you were talking about is there's the pattern where you can say something like input type equals range is equals super dash slider. And then in your web component JavaScript, you are saying class super slider, you know, extends input range. I forget the exact syntax, but you, you basically say this web component is specifically a customization of uh, range inputs or of text areas or whatever 
element it is that you plan to extend. And then in your markup, you have to say, you know, this element is of this type. And that's where you're, you're modifying things that are already built into HTML. Yeah. You're extending the elements themselves such that. Or you would be if such a thing actually worked. <laughs> okay. Whereas the other way to do it, which is the way that I was writing about is termed more composable or it is composable where you wrap some custom element name like super slider around a, an input type equals range and a, you know, whatever else you might put in there, a, a, a button to reset it or whatever. It doesn't really matter, but you're wrapping this element name that you made up around native HTML elements. Mm -hmm. And then your script is adding things sort of on top of that, but they're still just whatever elements they are inside. So that, like you said, if for some reason the JavaScript fails or doesn't load or, you know, uses some pattern that 10 years from now, like isn't even supported anymore because it was discovered to be an enormous security risk and browsers no longer allow it, then you still have a range slider <laughs> mm -hmm. rather than the sorts of things that sometimes we think about doing, which is, well, I'm going to make up this element. And I'm not going to use any HTML in it because I'm inventing new stuff. So I have to like do the whole thing myself to have to do it all myself. And I can't rely on the browser for anything when, okay, maybe there are situations where that's necessary. Although we have so many capable elements now, I, I can't think of anything where you couldn't rely on existing HTML elements, but that's actually really fragile. Yeah. And uh, Jake Lazarov had, a, I think, a really good post about this. Oh, good. I'm glad you're bringing that one up. Yeah, titled Web Components Will Outlive Your JavaScript Framework, which is talking about basically what we're talking about here, you know, saying, hey, if you do web components that are based on, you know, actual HTML with a little bit of just light touch JavaScript, you know, just as much as you need and no more, then that is much more likely to live and be workable over long periods of time than if you use something like React or Svelte or Vue or whatever that doesn't take this approach where everything is sort of made up and there's JavaScript that takes this sort of made up markup and turns it into HTML. Cause that's what those frameworks do, right? React at the end is outputting HTML and, and CSS and JavaScript. Like it has to, or else the browser won't render it. And if React one day follows the path of every other framework ever, which is it falls out of favor and becomes, you know, less desirable or, or whatever, you know, just people aren't using it anymore in 10 years, let's say, you know, your React site could be at risk of falling apart because it's like how oh, React, nobody supports that anymore. Yeah. Whereas if you just use the basic HTML and sprinkle a little bit of JavaScript on top of it, what we call quote unquote vanilla JavaScript, right? Like it doesn't use preprocessors or frameworks or extra libraries or whatever, that is much more likely to be functional over long periods of time, not just web long periods of time, actual long periods of time, you know, decades. And when you decide to move your blog from WordPress to Eleventy to some custom new thing in, in five years, like your custom elements are still going to work flawlessly. Yeah. And I've seen that work uh, across an enterprise where there's 20, 30 applications that are all sharing web components that are using like different technologies to assemble the pages. And that's pretty amazing, you know? Yeah. The sort of um, main point I think here that a lot of people are latched onto are this light DOM. You could use the light DOM. And an interesting thing that I don't know if people necessarily realize is that Shadow DOM is not part of custom elements at all. Like it's specifically designed to be separate from custom elements. At the time we were making all those proposals, there's like Dojo and EXT, Senka it is now, I think. And, you know, there's YUI, like there were all these widget libraries floating around out there that like basically you just put some hook in the DOM and then you call this magic function. <laughs> 
or you put some classes on it and this magic function discovers them. jQuery UI did something like that. And it magically writes a whole lot of DOM for you, right? Yeah. So there's two ends of that, right? One is you don't have to just put classes or or like worry about you figuring out when to scan the page for when those classes appear or something. Custom elements do like give you that part, right? So if you want to do that, you can do that. But even if you don't want to do that, there is a problem, I'll, I'll say. Um, it's, it's not a problem because we built like exceptionally great things this far with just the light DOM. And for a whole bunch of cases, yeah, that's, you should just continue to do that. Like if that works for you, then you should just continue to do that. But if you take your fancy slider now and you start distributing it to people and people start using it in all different kinds of contexts, dynamic context and things like that. Mm -hmm. If you're putting like magical new elements in the tree, there's all kinds of new questions, right? Like what happens if somebody puts something before the element that you're expecting or after the element that you're expecting, what happens when they query selector expecting that the tree is exactly what they put in there, <laughs> you know, and now it's different or they write CSS classes that think about like the last child or something. Um, it's like very easy for that to start you, you to start getting into these like friendly fire situations, you know? Right. Yeah. Namespace collisions in effect, <laughs> because yeah, right. Exactly. If you happen to use a, a, a class name in your page that is the same as a class name that the component is expecting, then you could end up accidentally, you know, turning your component to have a red background or something. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, and a lot of components do use at a very basic level, some similar concepts like, you know, a class BTN is in so many things, right? Yeah. Um, and BTN for button BTN dash something. Or yeah, yeah. Sometimes just BTN to say, yeah, here's how I want to style my button. Right. Or more, more often, here's how I want to style my div. <laughs> okay. Right. True. Yeah. So that, that was like part of what shadow Dom was supposed was intended to solve was like to allow component creators to create abstractions that were compositions to say like, Hey, browsers do this. Like internally, if you inspect, you can see the video element is full of buttons and spans and divs and <laughs> classes. And, you know, like, because they just use the same stuff as we would to build a video player, you know, in terms of the, the DOM parts, at least. Right. But they're encapsulated as as they say they're encapsulated but um i think of them like iframes which i understand is both apropos and completely inappropriate in various ways but like i think of a video element as being its own little iframe and all the stuff in there is just styled as, according to the stuff in that little box that little encapsulated thing and that's what shadow dom is supposed to do right it's supposed to basically say, okay, this over here is just in its own little capsule it is encapsulated and your styles from your page do not cross the boundary into this little capsule and the styles in this capsule do not break out to the page. Yeah. Um, it's funny that you use the word encapsulation because that is actually a driving part of this story. So do you mind if I, uh, do some history, <laughs> please? Um, so I said this before, but like people have wanted custom elements since like 10 minutes after Tim announced HTML, right? Like, right. cool, but how do I make my own elements? Um, it's a natural kind of question, right? Like it, it seems very natural. And we, web components is not the first try at that. Um, there were several tries and the concept of a shadow DOM predates all of this. Um, so the current web components is born from the ashes of another effort that was called XBL two, which mm. you might know replaced XBL one, <laughs> you would say built on, but it, it really kind of replaced because XBL one didn't really do a thing. XBL was extensible binding language. Is that correct? Yeah. We liked our X's back in the day. We sure did. Yeah. Um, but it had a concept of a shadow DOM. Uh, it was a, a rather vague concept, but even SVG from the very beginnings had a shadow DOM. 
So like this notion that like you need this, like there's this thing that's not your view of it from the tree is not the same as my view of it from the tree, right? Like you write this, but what the browser really has internally is more. Mm, yeah. And that more is currently anyway, um, just more of the same. It's more of the same dumb stuff. So when this was being uh, worked out, this new generation of components that would, or, or proposals that would come under this banner, web components, very quickly, there was a lot of engagement from, like it, it was being proposed by um, this parkour team at, at Google who had been working on it for kind of a long time. And there was like a lot of engagement from like Apple and uh, Mozilla and even, you know, community people. And in trying to describe this thing that is complex, unsurprisingly, we didn't have terminology that was great, right? And so people began throwing around those comparisons and also using lots of words that we try to use in programming. So there was like isolation, encapsulation, right? And it very quickly got confusing because like, what is encapsulation? Is it what an iframe does? I mean, an iframe definitely encapsulates things, right? Yeah. And so uh, Mache from Apple, who's like the, now is I think their director of WebKit or at least the, the lead head of engineering for WebKit. He uh, wrote this sort of like seminal email that then drove kind of a lot of things where he said, okay, we were using all these different words, but let's take this one encapsulation. And like, I would like to talk about, I think that there's many different kinds of encapsulation. Like who are you trying to encapsulate from what? <laughs> right. Okay. Anyway, who's listening about this, who doesn't know about, um, shadow Dom, um, the, the handiest way that I can think to explain this and sort of what I wish the whole thing would have been <laughs> is, you know, we have nodes and nodes are just these constructs in memory that we can say represent a tree, right? But like, there is no tree. It's just pointers that happen to be parents <laughs> and children, right? Mm. Leaves and, and things. Um, right. Shadow Dom just said, okay, look, everything in the Dom works off this concept of like parents and children. So what if there was just like a pointer that was, and it's like a way for you to connect to this Dom. And then like, it, it doesn't just mean parent and child. It means this other kind of connection that you don't have to work. Like everything just sort of works out because like your style sheet on the outside, no selector will automatically cross that today. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, no query selector will select into that because when you walk the Dom in either direction, the the chain is broken. You you can't walk up because it's not a parent. You can't walk down because it's not a child. In retrospect, this has been not the greatest in a lot of ways because we see lots of requests for open styleable shadow roots or slots in the light dom. Basically, people are like, it's too much, right? Like it's too much. Too much in the sense of like being too closed the way things yeah. are now. In some ways, and in other ways, maybe it's not closed enough because <laughs> you're because your JavaScript, you know, it's all global. It all has access to global in both directions, mm. unlike an iframe, right? Right. This whole confusion is, I think, a lot of why I have to admit I've just never liked Shadow DOM. I just don't, even though I sort of get the problem that it's trying to solve. You know, the idea of I want to be able to have this little thing over here. That's sort of its own thing so that I can plug this thing into multiple pages, like is, is one way to use it. So you, you create a web component that is like attached to pages via shadow Dom. And so each of those components is sort of its own little thing and they don't conflict with each other. They don't conflict with the main page. Like I sort of get that that can be useful, but just this whole it's closed, but it's not closed. And maybe it should be less closed, but maybe it should be more closed. It just the, way that it sets up this barrier that is difficult to cross has just never really sat well with me. And is, I mean, is a lot of the pre-existing assumptions that I brought to web components in general that probably kept me from understanding web components sooner. 
like and, yeah. and making that sort of breakthrough of, oh, these are things that I can do, right? Because the things that I'm talking about in my post and Jim and Jake were talking about in their post, Jeremy, you, you know, these are completely late Dom. There's no shadow root involved. There's no shadow Dom at all. Everything is in the light Dom. Everything is completely accessible from the page, right? And in some cases that might be a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are, these are not going to solve every scenario, but they really work for me because it's like, okay, well, everything's here. I can style everything. I can script everything. I can talk to other parts of the page very easily from my component. And that, that to me, it just fits better with my way of viewing how the web should work. Like better follows the grain of the web and Shadow Dom just has never seemed like it does. But the browser itself uses Shadow Dom. I know. <laughs> and yet. <laughs> I think this is part of the trouble is that we, we don't have the answers at the start. You know, to me personally, it feels like we missed some important aspects and use cases that have hindered the adoption of even custom elements, even though custom elements have nothing inherently to do with Shadow DOM, you know. But I think things that we missed at the time were like sort of treating everything as if they're like a single ish case. And one of the things that I see now is that we do have other cases like one that i have brought up in the past is um you know what's a useful thing to use child for maybe is there's lots of elements that are like here is a markdown processor or a ascii math or a latex mm -hmm. processor that yep. you as the author can just put in markdown or whatever you know when you do that you don't want to destroy the original content because you want it to be there and you want it to keep edit being edited and you know you don't want to be just constantly changing their whole tree but you know like it's not a secret what this component is doing you know um i'm not trying to hide from you that it's creating headings and m's and strongs and I, like i want you to know that is actually the point of this component and so I feel like in those kind of cases, like you just want your CSS to come through, right? Like you want your headings to look like your headings and your paragraphs to look like your paragraphs. Like that's a mistake to not have some means of cooperation there. That barrier is like way too hard for that, those kind of use cases. We don't, we don't have any solution for that. And there's, there's lots of, there's like three or four different things that we've articulated in terms of like, what a more open shadow root might be like and why you might want that. But it's tricky because I really do think that there is a important role for something which will be shadow down. And, and we also missed because of the barrier, we missed a lot of important accessibility questions because accessibility in ARIA is almost all ID ref. Hmm. Okay. And ID refs are, you know, a global mechanism and well, they don't cross, you know, they don't cross the boundary. We have some answers to a whole bunch of those questions. It's not complete, but in the AOM work, which I think is great. And there's implementations in browsers of ways to do like element references that do work in some of those cases. Work on that was done by Alice Boxhall, who's now here at Egalia. And some of that work was paid for by Salesforce. Cool. It's still very, very hard though. and the constraints, the goals of this have made it even harder. Yeah. But I mean, we're making this up as we go, right? <laughs> we're making, we're making the web up as we go from a technical perspective. I mean, from a content perspective, certainly, but from a technical perspective, we have been pretty much since the beginning, you know, this is why stuff gets into libraries and preprocessors and so on and so forth. And then eventually get folded into the native platform and, we try things like XBL and that didn't really work out. So we try XBL2 and that didn't really work out. And so there are these other proposals and eventually we come up with Shadow DOM and Shadow Root and that worked relatively well. But now we might look at it and say, okay, with the benefit of hindsight, it turns out maybe we should have done these things differently. You know, in some cases we realize maybe we shouldn't have done thing at all, like the visited styling eventually we realized, no, we should not be doing that for security and privacy reasons. 
because it turned out, yeah, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but turns out it wasn't. Yeah, we're we're making it up as we go along and like we need experiments. And I think that the real sort of primitive things that can only be done by the platform, there, there's no way other than for somebody to implement in, in the platform and try to get as much experimentation and feedback as possible. There's no other way to, to do that. And right. this plays off that thing we were talking about earlier about how like it takes a long time. Like you have to have the thing for a long time before you can really realize how to use it well. Yeah. You, your design has to make contact with the real world, basically. Yeah. The CSS working group has been through this problem more than once where their design made contact with the real world. And sometimes it worked out great and other times less so. CSS working group maintains a page on their wiki of things we will fix if we ever get our hands on a time machine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think everybody should have one of those pages. I wonder if we have one actually for web components. It'd be an interesting thing to do. There's a web components community group. Did you know that? I think I did actually. Yeah, you could join that. And um, that would, seems like it'd be a fun community group activity. Um, sort of critique that. And I kind of doubt that it would match if like what wig did it, you know, like people will have different impressions about what was a mistake and not, um, I mean, this is why there's so much yeah. stress on use cases, right? Like yeah. the trouble is I feel like we couldn't see the use cases from there that would be popular. That, I guess that's my, my take in the end, right? Like I said, there's thousands of custom elements out there, tens of thousands of custom elements, maybe hundreds of thousands of custom elements, way too many probably. Mm -hmm. Maybe these use cases are, like what percentage are they and how much do we invest in them versus how many we're not covering, you know, mm -hmm. that's where I think you have some in interesting thing to think about. So, you know, share your thoughts. Definitely. I think that's what we're coming and uh web components, web components are pretty cool. Yeah. Custom elements, custom elements. Very cool. That's, I think that's part of the problem. The banner we chose web components includes lots of things together that could be used to make the same thing that the browser has. But custom elements, they're just a way to plug into the life cycle of the DOM, and that is pretty sweet. Yeah, so if you're listening and you haven't checked out uh, custom elements, maybe uh, put that on your to-do list of things to just sort of check out and play around with because they're very interesting. Thanks, Brian. Thanks.